Well, hello folks. It's fiddle workshop time again. This is number 30 since it's been locked down. Uh, I haven't been able to do this live this time because um, we well, had a long day at a funeral um, earlier in the day and with boys to pick up for school and then we had to go and get shopping, groceries, etc. Which involved uh, mere in one place. And by the time I got back, it was just very close to seven o'clock. So I decided just to come up the very same evening and do this in Migby Kirk. Um, so I hope you're nice and cosy where you are, because I can assure you it's not very warm here, but it does sound pretty special. Well, it's the kind of thing that uh, sitting playing in here, you, you can get completely lost in your own sound. The, the sound of the place, the acoustics, I mean, you, you can just almost go into a trance. I mean, if I just play this. It's a pleasure being here, but um, being uh, that we only just got home, it wasn't really very fair, I didn't think, to um, monopolise the living room <laughs> when we got back. Sorry folks, I want the kitchen. So um, I've come up here, peace and quiet. Um, so um, we'll see how we get on. Um, I've got three tunes I want to maybe have a go at. Um, one of them being Tullish Gorham. Um, I was going to do that a few weeks ago, but I was a wee bit ambitious and I decided to play too, too long. Did any time for Tullach Gorham, so um, we'll maybe have a look at that the night. Um, I'm going to maybe have a look at Lusk and Tire, which uh, is one of my own compositions, a slow air. And it's, I mean, it's maybe difficult for a session, but it, it might have some nice insights for you on how I play that sort of tune. and. That I was going for when I composed it. And the first tune, it's a pipe march, a 6 8 pipe march, except it doesn't fit on the pipes. So it's nearly really a pipe march, is it? <laughs> but it's, it's that sort of style. Um, it's too broad, broad a range. It goes, I mean, there's notes in the G string right up to the E string, so there's no Y in there that that fits in the pipe register. But it's got a, a, a pipe tune feel. Well, I certainly think so, anyway. And um, it's a it's a fairly new tune. That, well, very new. I wrote it last week. <laughs> it's called "The Forest of Colbleen." Now, this type of six eight march, I suppose it's in the style of something like the Eiffel Highlanders. Now, now that would be a very well known example of the same type of tune. Um, but you often hear that played as a jig, kind of hell for leather. But it was never written to be like that. It's a six eight pipe march. So this is in very much the same style, and again, because it's in 6-8, you can set it for dancing to, um, you can play it quicker if you like. But for me, it, it feels better at a steadier tempo. Um, I'll let you hear it at both speeds actually, but I'm going to play it through for a start, and um, well here I, I go through it. Now it's F, this is in, um, but it's, I still think it's quite um, accessible, the, the B is actually, a, it's played as a natural every time you play it, so there you go. There's a few things to look good for, but um, anyway, let's hear a go with it, let's hear a go.
like, um, that's not a bad tune actually, I, it's one of these ones that I've written that I kind of quite quickly think I like that, I'm going to start playing it because um, <laughs> it's it's a long way from being every one of my tunes that, that I actually, um, I'm, I'm pleased with <laughs> some of them never get a second look, but that one I did quite like and it's it certainly was a tune that it seemed to write itself, it came out very, very quickly. Um, the night of four, I did a walk up to Tam Naviri Steen Circle. And when I was there, I had a, a, a flash of inspiration and came up with a tune. I sung it into my phone. It's a wonder I can get it. I'm nothing notated after that, but um, I wrote a tune about the, the experience of being at the Steen Circle and within the landscape and the history. And um, I wrote this tune called These Ancient Stones. And so I'd sat down the next morning to notate it. And before I'd started, this music started coming into my head. And it was the Forest of Culbleen. And um, if it was very much in my head at the time was something I was thinking about while I was up at the Steen Circle. I was lo looking across to the hill of Culbleen. And um, it's just stuff to do with the history and um, how long folk had been in the landscape. I'll, I'll play it through a couple of times, then I'll read out the, the, the bit that was kind of in the back of my mind when I was, when I was writing it. So uh, anyway, let's play it through slowly. Um, take our time, try and play with a bit of lift. Pull out the dotted notes, middle notes in the triplet. Very, very short. Um, try and infuse it with some grace notes as well. That's style of tune definitely benefits, it definitely helps with the character. It kind of gives it that authentic feel. So even the first note, just really thumb your finger down firmly. through again, second time we'll pick up the tempo. Um, I find even a tune like this, which is, uh, well it's a march, which you could play as a jig, I find it helpful that if there is some kind of story to the melody that has inspired it, to, to come with that is, because that really helps connect you to the tune. And I find almost invariably, nay every time, I'm not only human like, <laughs> but um, every time I play someone that's got a bit of a story, when I play it, if I'm totally into the playing and, and focused on it, which you sh should be if you're performing, 
and try to do it to the utmost of your ability. I do have images of the the story of the tune come to mind. So like if I'm playing a tune like The Beauty of Cremar before me, if I was sitting writing that, I can, that is in my head when I'm, when I'm playing it. So this particular tune, there was something that kind of sparked the, the writing of this. I'm going to read it out. This is, a tune, this is a book card. Well, that's back to front, sorry. But anyway, that's a book. It's called Legends of the Braes Amar. And in the introductory chapter, there is an early reference to the forest of Kulblin, which I'm going to read the hail passage to you. It gives you an idea if it was in my mind when I was writing it. The next mention of the Brazamar we find in Richard of Sirencester, who records the march of Gnaeus Tabellus, general of the Emperor Domitian, Anno 89, from the south of Scotland to the Murray Firth, to subdue the north of Scotland and the Orkneys. One of the legion's stages was at Tamea, which is taken to be what is now called Bremar. The Romans were routed, and Tibelus was slain. Hereupon they ret uh, retired into the forest of Culblain, and there elected Clilius, Clilius for the general. Again they gave the natives battle, and again they were defeated. Yep, dinner mess, boys. <laughs> so that was kind of it was in my head when I was writing this. Um, or if it was in my head when I was standing looking at Culblain for the Steen Circle. And um, there's more than which domin dominates the, the landscape in the Howard Kramar. Loch Nagar's further than a while, so Morven really does dominate. Um, but along with Morven is along kind of fairly flattish hill at Culblain, and around its lower slopes are certainly still forested to this day. Um, so, it, I suppose it was in my head, the, the, something slightly military, the, the, the native Picts gave him a bit of a clobbering again, twice again, so there you go. So that was in my head. So now, if you've been listening to this and you're looking at the tune, that might well, um, create pictures and imagery in your own head that helps connect you with the, with the music. So let's play again at the same speed, second time, I'm going to pick it up to, well, marching speed I suppose. <laughs>
fairly new. Um, hi, my, uh, my newest tune, to be quite honest. Um, contrast between that and jig speed. <laughs> See, I, I don't think it has quite such a good swing to it. To me, I, I, I don't think it feels quite as good as the, as the march speed. But there you go, it's a matter of taste. If folk want to play it up tempo for dancing, be my guest. I'm not going to get upset. <laughs> so, the Forest of Complain, we'll leave it there. With the Ro Romans being sent him to, to think again, possibly. Um, if we go to him, that is. Right. Right, um, I will say that this might vary slightly for the, the music copy, but I think mine is just something I've slightly um, built up over a long time to suit myself, but it's largely based on the setting in the film Music of Scotland, uh, the book by James Hunter. Hardy Press. So it's more or less that, but there will be some slight um, personal touches. So if it's not quite the same as fits in the book, then I worry about it, but it should be enough to, to hopefully keep you right. So Tullach Gorham, great Strispe. I mean, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It couldn't be ordered other than Scottish. I mean, it, there's no why it sounds Irish, no, definitely no English. It's very Scottish sounding and very old sounding. And it's a... Um, it's a tune that was considered old by Neil Gow's time, and two of the, the most famous exponents of this tune were indeed Neil Gow and James Scott Skinner. And Skinner was so teen by it that um, he, um, as sometimes was his wont, he um, added variations which are fairly extravagant. Um, I'll be honest, personally, I didn't really like them. Um, but they're, they never feel to be impressive to hear somebody that can play them. I did, I did sort of learn them up, but I just didn't really like it. It's a bit like, I don't play the president that often because I don't really care for it musically, but I can play it. So um, here we go, Talk Gorham, just the tune, just the tune. It's a big tune, and you have to really tear into it, I would say, while maintaining accuracy, um, but you have to play it with commitment. Things like updriven bows really add something to this particular tune, and um, there's double stops which allow you the, the, the freedom to kind of throw yourself at the tune really once you're confident, but that's the thing. How do you become confident? Confident? How do you become confident at it? Practice, practice and perseverance. Um, it can be frustrating, but that's the only why. So in this particular tune, it has got that, uh, uh, that really old, wild, highland feel about it. So, nay hurting back. Um, when this was written, Scotland was a very different country. Um, you did have folk gun and cattle raids still. Um, and many Highlanders were dressed in the kilts and went armed about the countryside. So, very different place indeed. So, let's go and here get a proper go at this slowly. We'll take it for the top, plenty of snap. So, near like this. yet to leave the double stops until you've got the melody um, or else you really bog yourself down it's difficult to try it's like trying to eat a turkey in one go just you'll make yourself in wheel 
So get, get the basics. It's like grace notes and unisons, or any of these sort of things. Then I'll worry about them until you've got a reasonable feel for the tune. So I would suggest just tuck the top notes, the melody notes. If you feel confident, go for the double stops by all means. So um, it would be made like this. You hear the snap there. driven this is that's how you play an up driven bow that's the kind of thing I would say like Neil Gow fame for the power out of his upstroke that's how you play it with drive all right for the top It's tricky, um, I'm not going to try and butter you up there, it is a tricky tune to play. Um, strings are up, uh, snap bows one after another, that's tricky to do because the down bow gets you as close to tip, slowing the up, so down up, down up, with snap and attack. Which I'm trying to avoid because I, I, I want that long note pulled out. Easy to rattle right up if you're not watching. And then you've got another two and you've nowhere to go. So I don't want that. You can't play it, I mean, it's perfectly. You can do that. I want the long notes there, I don't want them disappearing. Um, so plenty of attack on these snaps. These runs, fingers and bow need to be absolutely together, so slowly. Rather than... A wee bit of snap goes into that. Second to second, try and plant your second finger on the two strings. If you have littler fingers, you're probably going to have to roll, but you, you want to try and avoid going second left to second. It's a wee bit clumsy and difficult to articulate cleanly. So. So, it's a, a tune that you can really play with a lot of fire and a lot of power. And if it's played well, I have to say, if, if, if I hear it played well, the hairs rise in the back of my neck. It's, I think it taps into something deep, uh, something deeply cultural, uh, um, something in your DNA almost. It's like something that just came out of the landscape. It sounds a wee, wee bit waffly, but I'm not caring. That's what I think about it, it's a great tune. Um, I'll just tell you a wee bit about Tullach Gorham itself, because it's an actual place. Um, so, let's play it through slowly again. Two, three.
tune I think that they needed. I thought they went to hunnel the, the Romans at the, the forest I called Blaine. <laughs> Plenty of double stops actually on drones and I think they just fill things out. Be careful with the balance, make sure that the melody never gets bit, buried. And um, if you're playing double stops, mind that that is a paramount. Easy to be too heavy on the bottom string. But that, that G will resonate right through the hail bar. Another tricky thing getting for the D string right across to the E and missing the A. To play that on a snap is it's not that easy to do actually. Um, to be accurate, miss that string but hear the snap and the attack is quite a tricky thing actually if I think about it. And also I'm, I'm dropping even, even further across to catch that G. There's a lot of vigorous bone going on there. So, great tune, great tune. Um, the song of that tune um, that had lyrics set to it by the Reverend John Skinner. I did not know if it was a relation of James Scott Skinner, but a different era. But um, Robert Burns said it was the finest Scott song ever written in his estimation. So set to that tune, um, yeah, quite familiar. You often hear it sung for the tick the snaps out dum da dum da da ba da dum da 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 dum da dum da dum It's not quite high, I, I, I don't like it quite as much melodically, I, I like it with the snaps, I like the fire it uh, makes you want to get up and, and dance Anyway, that's a general idea So, I think we'll leave that and I'm going to finish up where we go oh, Again, my in tune, Lusk and Tire Before I do, I'm going to tell you about Tullach Gorham actually. The place Tullach Gorham exists, it's, it's in Strathspey, which is appropriate. The, the home of the music for it was developed. And um, halfway between Granton on Spey and Avi Moor, which is a, a beautiful area, um, as you drive along the north side of the road there, but halfway along, seven miles for Granton and Spey, keep your eyes peeled, you'll see a sign at the end of the road that says Tullach Gorham. And as you look towards the Cairngorms, um, the firm that is before you is Tullach Gorham. That firm that is around about you is Tullach Gorham. And um, I've played it there, I've been in about um, to the firm and played it at Tullach Gorham, which is quite emotional, I have to say. Um, folk think I'm a big... Tough, can I, well, not tough, but you can, I'm quite I'm big and loud. <laughs> and, and, um, but can I, I find out, can I get quite emotional place like that there? Can I, it's a real part of our culture to play the music in the place it was written about is quite a thing. So you're actually looking across the river Spey towards the Cairn Gorms. You can see the mountain of Cairn Gorm itself. Um, and um, a bit further down the barns of Beinick and it's um, it's quite it's quite something. Um, so there you go. You can go and see it. Feel the inspiration yourself. And apparently, now I was told that James Scott Skinner wrote his actual um, variations at the firm at Tullochgorm as well. So a great place, a great place. So Lusk and Tire, I'll play it for you. It's an ear. Play it first, 
and then tell you if it's a boot and then maybe that will help col colour it. But like on a slow air, keep it flowing, um, helps to keep if it's a boot before you play it. Um, I pull the long notes out, keep the short notes short, but keep it flowing. Dynamics, louds and softs, push and pull the tempo. Uh, Lusk and Tire is actually, it's a, it's a beach. Well, it's probably just a hill area, but the most notable thing is the beach. Got this white shell sand on the beach with this incredible blue aquamarine water and the mountains of Horace sweeping right down to the seashore. Um, the macher behind you, which if you've been there and the, the flowers are blooming, it's, it's something else. So part of the feel of this is it's got a sense of the kind of the ebb and flow of the water. I mean, music for slow airs should hear that anyway, but this, um, although I, I wasn't sitting thinking about that when I wrote it, it certainly, I think, comes through in the music. When I think about it later, I didn't think much about it when I wrote it, to be honest, it just came out. Anyway, Lusk and Tire. So, Lusk and Tyre itself, um, as I said, it's mainly kent for the beach, but there's, there's much more going on there than that. The beach is extremely long. It's a great long beach. I wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, half a mile to a mile long. And it's, it's a very broad beach, but that's beautiful sand. And in my experience, and admittedly, I haven't been there for, for quite a few years actually, but my experience of being there you were pretty much on your own, very few few folk there at the time, so there's a great sense of peace um, within the beauty of the landscape, and um, it is quite a stunning place, one of my favourite places to be honest, again, we're in coronavirus lockdown, so it doesn't look like it'll be heading across any time soon, but it does put me in mind to go back. Um, the, the west coast of the Hebrides, the outer Hebrides, um, are far, I have to say, most of the, the, the beautiful beaches are in the Outer Hebrides, and they are absolutely world class. The east side of the islands, from Lewis down to Barra, tend to be much rockier, and uh, might be better for fishing, I don't know, but certainly they're really rocky up the, the east coast, but the west coast, very, very sandy, so quite different in character. And um, it just looks across to the island of Tarancy, which um, Quite a few years ago now, um, there was a series um, called Castaways, and they had these bomb pots stuck on the island for a year. <laughs> they were trying to survive, and um, well, folk used to do it, but um, it's one thing, so I've 
been born into that, that kind of culture and environment that quite another to come up for the home counties to do to get away from it. But um, folk did that right enough, but anyway. Um, so it's a it's a lovely place. So um I think if you can keep that sense of beauty in mind, that's what you want to try and get across. So loud and soft, keep it flowing, ebb and flow with the music. Um plenty of bow. Let the music flow. Um Grace notes as well, I mean it's part of the Scottish tradition, regardless of it part of the country, the grace notes kind of colour the music, help it to sparkle. Um, we'll try it again, let's try it again. I'm not going to tell you if I pick grace notes, that should be really doing to the ind individual. But I do put that there, a turn. Just uh, the only hearn being in here, it has to be said, the notes just kind of hung in the air for you. So, um, I mean, that particular tune, well, I used to go with a girl for um, the, the, the Lewis, actually, and uh, that was a place we went a few times, and it was a kind of happy place, just the beauty of the landscape. So, I mean, that didn't, didn't, didn't work out, um, as these things sometimes are destined to be. But um, I was, I think I was sitting very late, a couple of years later on. So, I think it would have been probably about 1997. And sitting up late, um, no, it was about 1998, because I was actually playing professionally, and I didn't hate to get up and milk coos the next morning. And I was sitting up and I was just getting into the music, I had uh, the house to myself. I was just pretty much sitting the fire going, candlelight, and I was just um, playing tunes till I got them would have certainly been one. I was trying to get lost in the music. I was drinking whiskey, just trying to get into myself. And I, I was just trying to capture a wee, wee bit of that, something that had been lost in music. and. Um, and just the thought of that place just came to my mind and, it, and that's really what inspired the tune. So there was I, I, quite a lot going on with that, but I was quite pleased with it anyway. Um, it was eventually, it's been played by a couple of folk at the, the, the Young Trad Awards. Um, there was a couple of folk that won it and played it. And in one case, Kristen Harvey played it and won. And the prize that year was playing with the um, so the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra um, as part of the BBC Scottish Proms. So um, she played it again at that and it was all orchestrated and I, I 
I just didn't feel like my seat listened to it. And I thought, that just sounds grand, actually. And that was partly if it um, sparked the idea of writing a, um, a symphony, hearing one of my tunes orchestrated. Because I'll be honest, when I write music, that type of tune, it does, um, in my head, I'm seeing cinematic things. So, because I like movies, but possibly to do with that, then the music's a big part of that for me. But so, I, quite frequently, it's it, it's it's quite a cinematic thing that's going on in my head. So, when I heard it actually had been orchestrated, that just um, got the old brain box ticking. So, anyway, folks, I'm going to play once more, and then we're going to call it a night. So, um, Lusk and Tire. And then I'm going to say fairly well. Uh, I'm going to show you it right off very quickly. Um, I will just say if you've enjoyed it and you want to put something in the tip jar, that's grand. It's www.paypal.me forward slash Paul Anderson Shona Dawn. And um, we'll be there on Friday for Life in the Lounge. 30, is it 31 or 32? I can't remember. I think it's 31. I think it's 31. So, we'll see you later, folks. Have a good night.